Yeah. So I'm uh, Nicholas Aulis. My name is an Echo, but my parents do love me. Um, I'm an iOS engineer at Big Air Grinch, although I do more of a polyglot kind of stuff with the web team and uh, been trained on Android, but haven't actually gotten on any Android projects. Um, so this talk's gonna be about web accessibility. Uh, primarily, it's going to be, be based on Mac technologies, uh, as well as um, mostly just visual-based disabilities, because these are all very deep trees that <laughs> take time to learn. Um, so first off, let's just define what do we mean by web accessibility. Essentially, we're trying to ensure there are no barriers that prevent interactions with an app or site. Um, there are five main areas of accessibility, which is visual, motor, auditory, seizures, and cognitive. Uh, visual and cognitive kind of go hand in hand. Um, cognitive fits areas like dyslexia, where uh, screen readers are actually really important. Although they can see the screen, they usually need screen readers if it's severe enough um, to help them read. So why should we care? Uh, from both a engineering perspective, but also a business perspective, because it takes time, which means it takes a lot of money to develop for accessibility. Um, to try and help, we'll look at some numbers. So this is uh, the visual, hearing, cognitive uh, disabled in the US versus uh, just a few countries of their online users. Uh, because typically, especially as we go into startups, we love to uh, try and get into other countries, Canada being a good one because they're mostly English speaking, but you might need to get a little bit of internationalization for Fran French. French. Um, and the good part about investing in accessibility early is it is one of the rare cases where it's actually not technical debt, but technical interest that you get. Uh, it's a nice little investment because as you go into other countries, um, screen readers are standardized, or they should be. I personally haven't had too much experience with a Microsoft screen reader, but if it's like any of their other industry standards, it probably doesn't work the way industry standards are supposed to. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, the nice thing is when you go to other countries, as long as your formatting is proper, all you have to do is translate the strings that you're feeding to the screen reader, and now the disabled who are in France can now understand what's happening to the app, which is really nice with very little time. Uh, you also get a benefit that a lot of studies have shown. Uh, apps that are made accessible tend to have better UI, usually have better user engagement because it's intuitive. Um, it's easy enough to use with your eyes closed. <laughs> so um, what are other reasons though, especially for uh, let's say corporate VPs who, you know, these numbers are nice, but they don't really care. You know, it's gonna cost a lot of money, especially if you have a mature pl platform. Um, one of the big ones to talk about is the legally mandated accessible pizza. Um, so Domino's is very impressive in what they do on a technology standpoint. Uh, a couple of notes with them. They started tracking, you, they introduced an app to track when your pizza is going to get delivered 10 years ago. So well before, I think uh, USPS just got that feature this year. <laughs> but before, you know, on the uh, era of smartphones when they were first coming out, Domino's was out the gate allowing you to track where your food was. Um, they also created their own Siri-like voice integration before we had easy to use um, APIs in iOS. Um, and you know, as they mentioned now, if, if you've seen any of the articles, they're working on their own little drones and driverless cars to deliver pizza. They've always been trying to get at the forefront, and that's actually been really good for them because they were able to beat Pizza Hut in terms of um, good sold. And they put a lot of that behind the fact that they are everywhere, that you can order on almost any platform. Um, however, they're being sued, and in 2016, a blind customer sued because he couldn't order pizza from their website or app using a standard screen reader. Um, the lower court found uh, that the ADA does apply to your web presence, and by not being web compliant, you are actually breaking that and open for a lawsuit. Um, they ruled, though, they couldn't actually punish because uh, the Justice Department never actually finished making formal recommendations of what a standard is for web accessibility. 
That went to the appeals court. The appeals court actually fired back saying because the Web Standards Board, W3, uh, created their own web content accessibility guidelines, that there is a standard. Domino's had ample opportunities and that they are still violating the ADA. They sent it back to a court case, uh, back to lower courts to do the final ruling on is their site accessible. Um, and we will take a look at that later to show that no, it's not. <laughs> um, but it's important to note, these lawsuits are on the rise. Uh, so the last numbers I was able to get was the first half of 2018. Um, but these are all based on just websites, not apps. And uh, uh, blind users in particular suing because they're not able to use products. Domino's defense was, well, you can call and you can just order over the phone. And that makes us accessible enough to get through the ADA. But uh, they've been ruled that it doesn't. And in a town like Indianapolis, we do a lot of B2B software. Um, that's also potentially limiting too. Because if you do training software or anything like that, I have to be worried if I have a disabled user, can I use your software? Or am I gonna be a potential lawsuit myself because we chose to use you as, as a brand? Um, and I hate the pushing the legal side of it. Unfortunately, that's usually how you get the VPs on board because <laughs> uh, there's a humanitarian side, right? There's benefiting everyone. And one of the videos I like most was uh, Google's when they first announced their self-driving car. They did this great video and I'll have a link in um, my slide notes uh, to the video. But they uh, introduced a guy named Steve Manon uh, and he's a 95% a blind person who I mean, he's very dependent on his neighbors, his family, bus systems to do anything. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite parts. They're actually going through a Taco Bell, Taco Bell drive through something we don't really think about. But as a blind user, he never gets to do that. <laughs> and I think driverless, driver, driverless cars are a fantastic example of um, where technology can lift people up. Because it's such a beautiful technology that helps people, but if Google decides to put in a big, like go full Tesla and put a big old monitor in that's pure touch screen and has no screen reader, no accessibility, it'll shut out blind people. And that's an implementation detail that, well, we need to get to market, so we're not going to worry about it. I mean, obviously, Google's working on that very hard. That's, this was uh, their defining moment when they decided they could start taking these cars public. Um, and then another one was, so I don't know if anyone uses an Ecobee or Nest. Um, Ecobees are fantastic, they're accessible, and this is one of the app reviews from the App Store. For the first time in my life, I can control my AC. Um, something, again, we don't really think about as visual people, that as you know, things get more sleek, as buttons go away, uh, it actually removes a lot of independence from people if we don't think about them when we're building our products. So we'll get into the how. Um, and the big, big thing about making your site accessible is focus management. How people get around with the web um, is through a screen reader, and screen readers mainly focus on your web page's focus. Uh, this, the, the main part of that is gonna be through your structure. Um, one of the big rules I like to say is uh, HTML is for structure, CSS is for your styling. Um, I see a lot in websites we love to abuse um, header tags and do H1, H3, H4 randomly because it controls the style we like. But those are very crucial for people who are using screen readers to know where they are, what's a subgroup of that main group, and how they get around. Um, one thing I like to recommend is go with the bootstrap style where you just make your own H2 class and change your headers how you want, like that way, but you leave those um, so screen readers can provide context. Uh, another one should be Buttons are not links. Um, when a disabled person goes and tries to use a button, if it sends them to another web page, that's not standards. That's not what they're expecting to happen. Now, they see it enough that they probably know it's going to happen, <laughs> but it should actually be linked as uh, or listed as a link. The screen reader will let them know this is a link. This is going to send you to a different page because maybe they're not ready to leave the page just yet. <laughs> um, and then tab indexes, this one I don't see abused too much, but it should be either zero or one. Zero means, um, you know, let this just act as a normal tab, you know, just by hitting tab a bunch of times I can go through. If it's a negative one, only JavaScript can call focus, which is really great if you want to focus of the pages loading and you want to focus on like just the header where you normally wouldn't have a user focus on. 
uh, but you want the screen reader to go there. That way, if someone who just loves using their keyboard is tabbing through, they're not wondering why they're focused on a header that does nothing. <laughs> um, also, uh, to make this easier, there are linters out there. Indiana's pretty big with uh, React, so there is a fantastic JSX accessibility um, linter that will help you with the structure. Uh, accessibility is 90% structure. As long as your website is structured the way that the screen reader is expecting, it will do exactly what it thinks it's going to do. <laughs> so linters can help us there. Um, also with uh, single page applications, um, you need to allow users to know when things have changed. Uh, one of the difficulties on our, our app that we're working on right now is um, we shift without actually, we, we shift contexts between pages, but we don't actually change routes, which typically you're using a React router. <clears throat> it tricks the browser into thinking it actually went to a new page, so you can usually get around some of that, but you might notice some bugs. Um, the way we get with, uh, we let users know is with a thing called Live Region. I don't know if it'll let me. Kind of. Anyways, it's with a live region. A live region is um, mostly just a plain div. It, to a uh, visual user, they won't even know this thing exists on the page. Um, it's literally just a place that in JavaScript you can say, hey, I want to let a user know about this. And it doesn't. Um, require focus for the screen reader to know. The screen reader sees there is a thing with a aria live tag right at the top and it knows, okay, so at some point this might update and I need to let the user know. There's two different types of tags, a polite or assertive, which is pretty self-explanatory. One gets in line where the other one jumps the line to let a user know. Um, and then you usually give it a role, which uh, there are several roles, log, status, alert, Alert's really the only one that you probably will use aggressive with. Um, the rest should probably be polite. Log is great if you have, um, let's say, an interactive chat where someone might be responding, and you don't want to shift focus constantly when a user responds. You want to keep them on the keyboard. Um, when the user chat comes back, that's when you say, "Hey, Aria, uh, live. You know, here is this new thing. You need to read the user. Let them know what the agent said to them." Um, and you, should, you shouldn't need too many. Uh, we actually typically put one in like the source or the, the, the main part of the application, like down in like the main app file. Um, and then we just make a callable method. So whenever we need to alert a user for someone, we just have a, uh, we're using view. So we just have a little um, map action that we can just say, hey, tell a user this. And then it'll let the user know something changed. Um, Aria itself, as we get into it, is um, the main part of where you're going to be adding extra code to make things accessible. It stands for Accessible Rich um, Internet Applications. There's a very, very big list. I link to a cheat sheet in my notes as well. Um, these are the pretty much main ones we've used in our app. There's, of course, some other ones, but uh, the, the big one that's annoying is Aria Disabled. Um, the reason why I say that's annoying, annoying is because just because you call disabled on like a button, it will not tell the screen reader that that button is disabled. You need to tell it aria disabled equals true, so then it will actually read to the user that the button is dimmed, is what it actually says. Uh, autocomplete is just a nice way to let um, the screen reader know, hey, there's an extra list of things. Hidden um, will essentially remove it from uh, focus ability altogether. Uh, so when they're going through with a screen reader, it will just jump over that section that Aria hidden's on. It's really good for um, if maybe you have a modal pop up on your page and you don't want them to be able to mess around with all the or all the elements in the back, which will happen if it's not uh, hidden. And then you can just say all that stuff in the background, hide that, send focus to the uh, pop up, and then go from there. Uh, invalid is another. Thing if you have form validations, uh, the baked in forms will not actually tell the screen reader that there's an error. Um, you will have to trigger an invalid just to let them know. Uh, label, placeholder, uh, and details are all kind of the same. It essentially just allows you to override context or add additional details to context. That way, if you have like two buttons that both say like sign up for $9.99 a month, it's not just going to read 
button nine ninety nine a month. <laughs> It'll actually say like you can say, hey, sign up for a monthly fee or uh, however they want to. The act of descent is probably the hardest. So combo boxes uh, are the most annoying thing to make accessible. But once you get that down, you will understand accessibility. Um, <laughs> and the reason why is so we have an aria label just so it can tell it's a tag. Um, we have to set whether or not the combo box is expanded so we can properly tell them. Uh, this aria owns is because you'll notice there's a div and then there's the combo box list and their siblings. This way you can say this little list belongs to this div. When the user goes forward, don't jump to the list. The list doesn't matter unless you're, go you're getting to the list through the combo box. Um, has pop-up also lets it know this is the pop-up and whether it should be there. And then once we get actually into it, the active descendant right there actually says which one in the list is currently active. Um, the combo box is the most annoying thing. <laughs> and especially like in our project, we decided to roll our own combo box. So it made it 100 times harder. <laughs> um, but it's important if you get into accessibility to get into it early, not late in your project, because we waited until a few months before the first beta was supposed to ship. And then the accessibility team comes back to us and say, hey, your entire combo box needs to get deleted. It's horrible. And it doesn't work any way the standards are supposed to. So we had to rewrite a good chunk of the app from scratch uh, or from the ground up again, just because we waited till the last minute. It's kind of like testing, where if you um, write your code knowing you have to test it, it's 100% easier to test, <laughs> where instead if you write it just thinking, oh, we'll get to testing later, um, you find that, oh, this isn't functional at all. It really depends on state, and we have to rewrite a whole bunch of stuff just to make this even testable. Um, so those are the big things with ARIA. Um, it really helps just provide context to extra users. The other big area of difficulty, especially in single page applications, is changing focus when in JavaScript. Um, this was a trick I picked up. I, I looked on for a long time. Uh, luckily, one of our uh, client's accessibility teams was able to lend some help <laughs> because a lot of people just say, just keep calling um, focus until it triggers. But essentially, you need to pause 350 to 500 milliseconds, depends on the computer and screen reader, um, but between focus events. If you do it any shorter than that, uh, the screen reader will lose focus, and the app's pretty much worthless at that point, because now you have focus in one area, and then the screen reader thinks you're in a completely different spot, and it just essentially desyncs. You have to reload. Um, you should also make sure that they're fully loaded, and you'll see this once we get into the example. Uh, the reason why is there is a black box that appears on the screen because being blind doesn't mean you can't see anything. It means that you've lost a significant portion of your vision. So stuff like uh, contrast, black boxes, stuff like that still helps users figure out where they are even if they can't see details of where they are. Uh, and that black box being a tiny little portion of the screen when it's supposed to be a big chunk can really mess with people. <laughs> so it's important to make sure that those boxes stay together. Um, and the best thing to do is build helper functions. We never call on an element.focus directly. Everything goes through what we have. We have a, one that's just called alley focus. And, um, and then that can work with asynchronous too. So any type of asynchronous code also has callback. So we know when it's finished. And only when we get that callback do we then fire our um, accessibility focus code. And that way we don't lose focus because those bugs do take a long time. So before we get into the example, uh, a few key bindings to know. Um, and this is all Mac-based, unfortunately. So if you're on Windows, I'm sorry. Um, the big thing is toggling voiceover. Uh, if, especially if you're doing um, development, you don't want to be jumping into your accessibility menu constantly to turn these on and off. So uh, just Command F5. Um, going forward, we refer to everything as voiceover, but that essentially just means option command. Um, and then how you navigate around. You can read the next or previous item just by the, the voiceover arrow keys. Um, something we, I think we all do is <laughs> move around using the tab keys and shift tab to go back and forth. Uh, the rotor is a really uh, nifty tool. So what it does is it actually just opens up a prompt 
that essentially allows you to go through and say, hey, I want to know all the images. I want to know all the headers, the links uh, on this page. It's also searchable, so you can start typing in if they have an idea of where, what they're looking for. They can narrow things down if, if it's a really long web page. Um, this is why, again, headers are important, because when you start searching through headers, or if you use the go to next header keyword or, um, shortcut, you can jump around pretty badly if things aren't aligned properly, or you may think you miss things. Um, the last one is just going into groups and objects. Anytime you have like a header or a big uh, group, um, it is important to jump down into them. So it's uh, the voiceover shift, and then up and down, get you in and out. Um, but we'll do a quick demo and kind of show the accessibility. If I can get this. Um, there we go. All right. So for this one, we're going to look at Domino's since uh, they've had some issues. And we will. For this, I do have uh, my voice over, uh, the actual voice turned off to not annoy everyone. Um, I meant to bring my other keyboard so I don't have to play with the touchpad. There we go. So the nice thing you do get, um, especially as a developer, is the uh, kind of context box to give you feedback of what's being said, especially if you don't want it constantly talking to you. Um, that is the one surefire way to get my wife to leave the room when I'm working from home. Um, so we're on the uh, website right now. Uh, to go into it, we're going to do the... Um, Oops, jump into it. There we go. So you can see on the, hopefully you can see on the top, uh, this black border box. That's going to be our screen reader focus area. Uh, and we're just going to jump around. Um, we're going to try the order online. All right. Yep. So I have to slowly jump through these, because if they were grouped, I could easily just jump from the header straight down to this other group. Uh, and this is where grouping also is nice, because I don't care about the car icon. I do want this, which is uh, clickable, where the other one's apparently just a group. No idea how that happened. <laughs> we'll just jump into that. Um, so this is another place where focus management is good. So when we hit um, delivery, there is no ARIA live. So there is no way to let a user know that a form appeared. We should also have jumped to the form, considering that's exactly where we want to go next, because that's what you know they care about. We're going to try carry out, though. I prefer not to enter in my home address. So. <laughs> um, So, and this is where uh, single page applications can also have issues. After a page loads, if we don't call focus, then we just get this little box in the middle of the screen what we were last focused on, and it still thinks it's there. I mean, it, it even says we're currently on a text um, element inside a level three header for some reason. Um, so we can open up the rotor, and this is where we get the, um, so this is the links rotor. There's also the headings one, which there's only one heading. Landmarks. Um, so yeah, so this is what happens when you know we uh, don't provide any ex any additional context. Just order carry out, order carry out, order carry out. Um, we're just gonna select that one for fun. And so we're lost again, unfortunately. Um, so we're gonna try and get some pizza. Oh, I actually got on the menu this time. Oh, oh. There we go. That's actually the first time I made it straight to this menu. That's impressive. All right. Try enter, maybe. OK. And then once we get to here, it's typically where things break down for me completely. Um, there's uh, not been any. Oh, wow. I made it farther than I did. I think they've updated this. But. 
So uh, these should be grouped items because we have the 10 inch small. Um, I shouldn't be able to jump through. And this is something very typical. This is this happens on Grubhub, Uber Eats, DoorDash. None of these companies are actually accessible. Um, and frankly, if one of these companies would become accessible, they have a large user base that would only use them because they would be the only ones they can. Um, so, okay, I gotta. No, <laughs> not on this site. <laughs> um, yeah, and this is where like users should be able to tab. You know, after getting on this large, I should be able to tab. It should get me back to order, but I can't. Um, the best thing I would be able to do at this point would be to open the rotor and look through links. And as you see, everything behind this modal is completely selectable. And that's one of the biggest problems when you don't use ARIA hidden, because now this guy has no idea what he's dealing with. Last thing he knew, he was ordering a pizza. <laughs> and, um, and this is essentially what the lawsuit's about, is uh, the courts have ruled time and time again that if you have an online web presence, you are bound, you are bound to the ADA, that you are supposed to be accessible. Um, again, I don't like to play the legal card because, frankly, we should be pushing to lift everyone up. That's the beautiful thing about technology. It makes everyone's life simpler. Um, and we shouldn't leave out a big segment of the population just because, well, it's a bit more difficult to, make, to lift them up. That's not a great response. Um, and I honestly wish I had a great, I was looking through all the ordering sites hoping to like find one to be like, yes, this is the site you can order food with that's accessible, but I couldn't find one. Um, I didn't have time to go through apps. iOS is extremely accessible. Uh, they bake it in. As long as you don't write your views from um, code, you actually use storyboards, you get so much accessibility built in. Uh, usually at that point, it's a uh, implementation detail where, um, like when I, when I used to work at Cluster Truck, we were trying to play around with that. And because there was no search bar built in uh, at the time, there is one now. Uh, you essentially, if you wanted something at the bottom of the menu, you had to scroll up, which is a three finger scroll, and it goes up one screen at a time, so you can, it can read the context of the page. So it took us at least 40 minutes to order food when we tried it the one time. <laughs> but it was possible, I will say that, it was possible. Um, so let me uh, actually let's turn screen reader off so that doesn't keep happening. Um, so, uh, for closing for this, so a big thing um, when we're building a new feature, this is of course assuming you guys have done the hard work and got your app all the way up to accessibility and I'm very proud of you for that. Um, what, what do I do when I create a PR in my project because I know it's going to go through an accessibility team uh, and at this company accessibility is everything um, because they, I mean, they, their lawyers realize they face, that we're writing internal software and if they can't hire someone because their software isn't accessible, then they they're, have a potential lawsuit for discrimination. Um, so if anything comes through that's not accessible, they can shut it down. Doesn't matter what business wants, doesn't matter what design wants, they have the right to shut anything down. Um, so the first one is to use the linter. I mean, just like with any you know, JavaScript, you know, working on a big team, linters are everything. You set up rules on how you feel things should work and everyone has to abide by them because otherwise it doesn't compile <laughs> or it throws an error for you. Um, verify after you build a new feature, just run through real quick with voiceover and just see, does this flow the way I think it's supposed to flow? Does it tell me the things that I'm supposed to, like does it tell me things are disabled? Does it tell me things are invalid? Um, you know, do I actually get that context? And you can just read it in that box. You don't have to listen uh, to, I think it's Victoria by default. Um, or you can't if you work from home and that's the only conversations you get all day. Um, I'm not venting. Um, and uh, don't always go down the happy path. That's something I actually just dealt with this week. I got three PRs up really quick on Monday. I was super happy about my progress and then they tried the non-happy path <laughs> and uh, everything got sent back because as soon as you go off that happy path, which happens, especially if you know a, a voiceover user just accidentally misclicks, uh, again, they don't like their context is what their screen is telling them, so you have to be prepared for misclicks, um, especially with 
Uh, as much as I love Apple keyboards, they're very sensitive. <laughs> so misclicks happen all the time. That's why I was going to bring my own keyboard in. So I, the misclicks would drop a little bit. Um, but yeah, so uh, that's all I had prepared. Um, uh, by the way, you can go to this uh, Aulis slash NDRB, and it has uh, all of my notes. It has links to technical documentation to help get you started, cheat sheets. Uh, it has a few of the news articles I used for this um, study, as well as a link to a um, HTML page with the slides. Uh, we are hiring. Um, we don't do too much into your, or too much RB stuff anymore. <laughs> um, it's unfortunate we we currently have a contract right now, but our main thing is mostly front end. Uh, no one can find JavaScript developers. We are looking for someone who can do Vue or is happy to learn Vue, uh, as well as a full stack developer who can do like front end JavaScript plus some Java backend. But we do C sharp, Ruby. I mean, whatever. Whoever hires us <laughs> is what it comes down to. We have expertise across the field. We're also looking for two Android developers, but I know that's not this room. But I'm going to throw it out there. If you know an Android developer or two, um, we're going there. Uh, and then, of course, you can check out VignerRanch.com. We do React training now uh, and blogs and all that fun stuff. But if anyone has any questions, I'd love to answer them. <laughs> So you've done all these steps with the checklist, but like I, so I watched an accessibility user feedback session today, and I'm like, oh, oh shit, like, we absolutely need the checkbox of by the way compliance, but it's not compliant, or it's not, it's not useful. Okay. Um, in that, like, I watched the person, like, the thing that was really painful for me to observe was that the person, you can't scan, you just cannot scan at mm. all. And they first were like, well, they wanted to sign in. They looked for a form on the box or on the page, didn't find it. Looked for links, didn't find it. Looked for headers, didn't find it. It was a button spoiler alert. Mm. Like, reading through the whole page. But do you, do you validate your work to, to see? Because I think the thing I want, the, the big takeaway I had from today was that um, if you've never in your life seen the page, your screen reader experience is 10 times worse than the first, like, if you've seen yeah. it and navigate. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and that's actually, uh, so the, the, I'm with a large Fortune 500 client right now that has an extremely large accessibility team. Um, I don't know exactly what all of their training is, uh, but they are brutal in their reviews, <laughs> and they find literally any kind of small thing you may have missed. Um, so uh, that's actually probably one of the hardest bits about it, though, is trying to, um, you know, I'm going to try and use this without knowing what to do. The best thing I can say there is, uh, you know, especially in Macs, they actually have a training mode for their screen reader. When you go to enable it, if you go through their normal prompts to enable it, not through the shortcut, uh, you can go through the screen reader tutorial. Um, if you guys have time with UX developers, um, have the people that they are testing their UX designs on learn that real quick, and then just give the side a roll with the screen turned off. Um, iOS does it really well. You can set it up, I think, it, like a setting where you can do like three taps and the screen just turns off. It still works, it's just the screen's off. Uh, Max is a little bit easier. You can just scroll the brightness down until it's off. Um, but yeah, it's especially once you know a site, that's kind of like the hardest part is not going down the happy path. Um, and that's why I like the rotor a lot because the rotor is a place someone's going to go to find context really quickly. So if um, you you know have a login, make sure that in the rotor that is like prominent, whether it's in the forms or in the links, uh, but provide the user from there a word that says sign in, login, or something, because um, that is where they're going to go typically. I'm sure everyone has their own little method, <laughs> uh, but that is going to be uh, the rotor is a very big resource when you get to a, a web page for the first time. Um, so if it's not in the rotor or it looks weird in the rotor, that's going to confuse someone. I don't. Um, that's a really good question. Uh, I would say, statistically speaking, it would probably be more Windows. Um, and the reason why I say that is um, uh, typically uh, people uh, with uh, disabilities have a harder time uh, landing higher jobs. They use older computers or they go to libraries. Um, 
and you're going to essentially have a harder time uh, getting your hands on Max. Although I will say in a study from Cornell um, on disabled users and the technology they do use, while they didn't mention the OS, they mainly use smartphones and tablets. Um, so making sure that your uh, Android has fantastic screen readers, I think it's called VoiceOver, or no, not VoiceOver, TalkBack uh, is what Android uses. Um, making sure that it works on iOS, because iOS screen reader is a little bit different too than the Mac OS one. Um, that is disproportionately more what, um, at least in the Cornell study, I don't know how accurate it is, but in their study they said that there is a disproportionate number uh, who mainly use just tablets and uh, phones instead of computers. Um, I'm not sure why. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yes and no. Um, and, and the main reason for that is uh, it's kind of going back to the Google Car example, where you can build this amazing vehicle that could really revolutionize the lives of those who can't see. But if your user interface is bad, they're still not going to be able to take advantage of it. Um, inside of Domino's app, they have built their own smart assistants called. Uh, Dom, who uh, you know, came before Siri or before Siri was opened, um, and that voice assistant is inaccessible. It exists in the app, but you can't use the app in an accessible way to get to Dom. <laughs> so if they would just make that a little bit easier, you could actually use their um, voiceover assistant, which should be using natural language processing. Really? Yes. I got to just got. I lost a lot of respect for them. Um, <laughs> Wow, okay. I was it's even better. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's normal and like listen to two seconds of what we say and then Yeah, I I know that that's what they used to do with like um like when you would like call a big company, you'd essentially just have people listening and I knew I didn't expect Domino's to actually do that. <laughs> They, I mean, they, it was people that weren't having a conversation, but they would listen to the to the transcript and put it in real quick. Okay. Um, yeah. So, for that case, yes, machine learning can help if companies <laughs> would use it. <laughs> Yeah, um, so uh, in, in um, the link I have, it will take you to a um, ES lint for JSX. Um, Vue, I don't know offhand, I'm, I should because that's what I use on a daily basis right now. <laughs> um, but uh, our client's very stingy about any extra plugins, so we've just decided to just fight through and deal with tickets coming back. <laughs> Uh, but there are good linters out there. I would be surprised if someone hasn't at least forked the JSX one to make it work with you. Um, yeah. So what about, uh, so that's like validating your individual JSX in your, your views in your code. Are you aware of any tools like a Chrome plugin just for looking at your full site in the browser and getting some hints? Yeah, unfortunately, um, there's not any good solution for that just because the screen readers are third party tools that they themselves get confused and that's typically where the bugs happen is um, the page shifts and your website thinks focus is here but the screen reader has no idea and the screen reader doesn't tell websites anything. Um, and that's kind of the biggest problem is there is no, unfortunately there's no UI testing for voiceover. Um, that's something we did spend some time experimenting on because we have a lot of or we have a lot of tests that we have been automating, and then there's this big chunk of voiceover tests that we just it's a dead end until they until Apple or whatever screen reader there are professional screeners out there too, uh, not just the ones built in the, the computers. Um, until those provide some kind of API to talk to, unfortunately, we're extremely limited, which is 
again, part of the problem with getting um, you know your leadership on board is not only is this going to take a bit to implement, but on occasion we need to do large testing to make sure it's still relevant. Because even like when I roll out a feature, um, something on the back end changed, a response is a little bit slower than it used to be, and now, or someone implemented a CSS animation, and now when we switch these screens, we're losing focus, and we never lost focus before. And we didn't realize that until we did another big sweep of the application to see how voiceover was working. But yeah, any other questions?